Hello! Welcome back. Now we are going to proceed into the next section of the class, which is sociolinguistics. So, just to situate ourselves, we climbed the ladder of core linguistics. We learned the nuts and bolts of how languages work. So that was phonetics through semantics. And now we're in the section of the class where we are applying the knowledge that we learned in core linguistics in order to describe a lot of these interesting aspects of language. So now we've finished talking about pragmatics, which is like how we use language in conversations. We're proceeding now to sociolinguistics, where we're going to be looking at how language is used, how language is structured within a society as a whole. So here we are. Sociolinguistics is the study of how language is used in communities and how language varies within and between communities. So pragmatics was the study of how we use language in a sort of micro scale interaction, like a conversation. But sociolinguistics is about how language manifests itself on the level of a large society, large communities, communities that contain in themselves other communities. Now, we can begin studying the variation of language across a community by seeing if we can detect any variation in the English language within the community of the United States. So we'll just start off by asking, what would you call a sweetened carbonated beverage? Would you call it a soda? Would you call it a pop? Would you call it a Coke? Would you call it something else? So think about what you would call this thing. It turns out that what you call this thing varies from region to region in the United States. So there's variation in the English language within the United States based on geographical region. In the blue regions here, people who grew up in those areas will call this thing pop. In the red regions, people will call it soda. In the green regions, they'll call it Coke, even if it's not a Coca-Cola product. I personally grew up calling it soft drink, which apparently is not big enough to merit a uh, portion on this map. But the point is that we see that it's not like the English language is one monolithic thing. There's actually variance based on geographical regions, in this case in terms of the lexical semantics, in terms of what words we use to describe this particular thing in the world. Here's another example. What do you call this bug? This little guy right here, what is this? So think about what you would call it. Let me know in the comments what you would call it. Now, if you grew up around here in California, you probably call it a roly-poly. And the areas of the United States marked in red here, if you grew up in one of those areas, then you would probably call it a roly-poly. In the green areas, you might call it a potato bug. In the very small blue areas, you might call it a pill bug. So we see that, again, there is this variation in what you call this thing. And this is an interesting case because this is a bug that you typically mostly talk about during childhood, right? And so the word that you picked up for this thing is something that was transmitted to you in childhood when you were probably interacting mostly with other people who grew up in the area where you were. So we see a lot of variance in regional dialects, as we see here, often for these words that deal with things that you encounter in childhood, like a uh, roly-poly. I grew up calling it a doodle bug, which is apparently not listed here. So here's another example. This is maybe not something you deal with in childhood, but what do you call a traffic scenario, traffic situation, where several roads meet in a circle and you have to get off at some particular point? What do you call that thing? So in the blue areas here, that's going to be called a roundabout. In the red areas, it's going to be called a traffic circle. In the yellow areas, it's going to be called a rotary. And in the green areas here, they don't have these things. So we see again this regional variation in lexical semantics within the English language. How about this? We see in this example that the regional variation in English is not just about semantics, it's also about phonetics. It's also about phonology. So how would you pronounce this word? This word spelled P-A-J-A-M-A-S, this uh, thing you wear when you go to sleep. Would you say it as pajamas or as pajamas? Now in the blue regions, if you grew up in one of the blue regions, you probably say pajamas. If you grew up in one of the red regions, you probably say pajamas. I grew up saying pajamas. So now you can figure out something about where I might be from. How about this? 
this is an interesting example. This word R O U T E. Do you pronounce that pronounce that as root or route? So in the red areas, you say um, either one. So in some cases you'll say root, in some cases you'll say route. In the blue areas, it's always root. In the green areas, it's always route. The interesting thing here is that you see that it's not like the geographical region you're from fully determines your pronunciation of every word. Within the red regions here, there's still variance. Within these regions, you could say root sometimes, you could say route sometimes. It's like these two different pronunciations are mixed up even within a particular dialect region. So let's summarize the structure of the variation that we saw. The first thing we should note is that every speaker speaks a language slightly differently. Some people might say root, some people might say route, even within the same community. A speaker's individual language variety is what's called an idiolect. So your particular way of speaking, any language that you speak, is called your idiolect, and everyone has a slightly different idiolect. When a group of speakers speaks in a way which is noticeably different from some other group, we say that group speaks a dialect. So a dialect is just a language variety spoken by a group of speakers which is noticeably different from some other language variety spoken by a different group of speakers. And a group of people that speaks a dialect is called a speech community. Now I'd like to emphasize that everyone speaks some dialect. It's not like some people speak the language and other people speak the dialect. Everyone speaks a dialect. Speaking a dialect just means you're a member of some speech community. Now these dialects that we all speak, they vary in terms of their phonetics, their phonology, their morphology, and their syntax. So all the levels of description we talked about in core linguistics, those are all ways in which dialects can vary one from the other. When a dialect varies in terms of sound, we call it an accent. So when you say someone is speaking with an accent, what you typically mean is that they are speaking using the particular phonology and phonetics of some dialect. But the term dialect encompasses more than just accent. It also encompasses the morphology, the syntax that people of that dialect use, and also the semantics in terms of things like the lexical semantics of the words they use. So this raises an interesting point. At what point do we say that two speech communities speak different languages as opposed to different dialects? So if two people are speaking very differently, would you say those are two languages or two dialects of the same language? When two people are speaking two dialects and they can understand each other, we say those two dialects are mutually intelligible. And a common way of defining what a language means is that it's a set of mutually intelligible dialects. So if two dialects are mutually intelligible, then we usually, typically, say that they are the same language. But we're going to have to add some qualifications to that. There are cases in which we would not apply this definition. When two dialects are mutually unintelligible, then we usually say that they are different languages. But again, we're going to see that there are important exceptions. So here are some of the complicated situations that can arise when we consider this idea of mutual intelligibility among dialects. Spanish and Italian speakers can typically understand one another. It's a little difficult, but if you speak Spanish well, you can typically understand Italian at least like 95%. And yet, these are considered different languages. They're mutually intelligible, but they're considered different languages. What's going on? Another example, which goes in the other direction, would be that Portuguese speakers from Portugal and Portuguese speakers from Brazil typically cannot one understand one another. And yet, these are considered two dialects of the same language, the Portuguese language. Similarly, Mandarin speakers typically cannot understand spoken Cantonese and yet they're considered one language. They're considered two dialects of the Chinese language. Another example which makes it even more complicated. So Danish speakers can understand Swedish. They can watch Swedish TV without subtitles, and it's a little difficult, but they can understand it. But Swedish speakers cannot understand Danish. So would you even say that Danish and Swedish are mutually unintelligible, or that they're mutually intelligible? It's an asymmetrical relation here. 
Sometimes also, you get a situation which is called a dialect continuum. So I'll explain what a dialect continuum is here. So let's say we have some village of spe people somewhere speaking some dialect, which we're going to call dialect A. And then in the next village over, they speak a slightly different dialect, and we're going to call that dialect B. And they're mutually intelligible, so we would say that they are dialects, two dialects of one language. Now, let's say the next village over is where they speak dialect C. And let's say that dialect B is mutually intelligible with dialect C, but dialect C is not mutually intelligible with dialect A. So what's going on here? Would we say that this is one language or would we say that this is multiple dialects? You could even have another village, the next one over, speaking dialect D. Maybe dialects D and C are mutually intelligible, people can understand each other, but someone from dialect D is never going to understand someone from dialect A. So we see that dialects can form this sort of chain, this is what's called a dialect continuum, and it makes it very, very difficult to define where is the boundary where it turns from one language into another. This is a situation where neighboring dialects are mutually intelligible, but distant dialects are not. This is a state of affairs which is very, very common all over the world. This has especially been more common in the past when travel was slower and more difficult. So for example, it used to be the case that from French to Spanish, you actually had a dialect continuum. You could get on your bicycle in Paris and go over to the next town, and the people in those two towns would be able to understand each other. So the Paris dialect and the next town dialect would be mutually intelligible. You could go from town to town, village to village, all the way from Paris to Madrid. And in each neighboring town, people could understand each other, but you would slowly transition all the way from Paris French to Madrid Spanish. So in that case, where would the boundary be between Spanish and French? So nowadays, because of the rise of national standard languages, which we're going to talk about, this dialect continuum is not really present so much in France especially anymore. But this is the typical state of affairs for languages in the world, especially before modern transportation and modern states. So there are dialect continua like this, which connect languages like French, Spanish, Italian, there are, it is a dialect continuum between standard German and standard Dutch, and many others. So remember, this is sort of the normal state of affairs. So it turns out that the designation of language versus dialect is usually determined by mutual intelligibility, but in practice, it's often determined by political factors. So there's a common quip which linguists like to cite, which is that a, dia a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. So once your dialect attains political autonomy, the idea is then you would call it a language mostly for political reasons rather than for reasons of mutual intelligibility. And one interesting aspect of this, which I've alluded to, is that most regional dialects across the world are less different from each other now in the year 2021 than they were, let's say, 100 years ago. And it's interesting to think about why that might be the case. Why don't you leave a comment on the video for why you think it might be the case that regional dialects are less pronounced now than they were in the past. So now, for the remainder of this particular lecture, I'm going to illustrate the ways in which dialects vary from another, vary one from another, by examining the different regional dialects spoken in the United States, regional dialects of English in the United States. And I'm not going to get through all of them today, but we're gonna go through some of the major ones. So this is a dialect map of the United States. This indicates the regions where people speak the major dialects, the major varieties of American English. So I want to emphasize that this is a coarse-grained map. We could draw a much finer-grained map, Remember that every individual person speaks a slightly different idiolect. So at the highest level of granularity, we would have to draw a circle around every single speaker here. But this is a relatively coarse map which indicates the major dialects, the major dialect boundaries within the United States. Here's an example of a more detailed 
dialect map. This separates out the dialects into even smaller subregions, and for some cities here, it even gives the dialects for particular neighborhoods. And this is what a detailed dialect map of a region like the United States might look like. We're not going to go into the detailed dialect map today. We're only going to look at the major dialects within the United States. So let's say that you want to identify a dialect. Let's say that you have someone who's speaking. You want to figure out maybe where they're from, maybe where they learned English. And how would you tell? How would you identify the dialect that they're speaking? How would you identify a regional dialect? The idea is that you would identify particular variations in form and map out where people show each variant, and then you can place that individual speaker in terms of where they likely learned English. So for example, here's a word, C-O-T. It's pronounced cot. So for many of you, um, if you're an American English speaker, then you would pronounce this as cot, which would be phonetically spelled like this. There's another word, C-A-U-G-H-T. And now the question is, would you pronounce this the same or different from the word cot? Would you pronounce it the same as cot, or would you pronounce it maybe differently as something like caught? This turns out to be a major signal which differentiates one dialect from another in the United States. If you grew up in the West, in particular on the West Coast, like in California, then these two words likely sound identical to you, cot and cot. If you grew up elsewhere, then they likely sound different. So cot is cot, the second one is caught, cot, caught, two different vowel phonemes for those of us who speak dialects in which those are different. So this phenomenon is something called the cot, caught merger. A merger is any sound change any change in the phonology and phonetics of a language which has the effect that two previously distinct sounds are merged into one. And it turns out that the, in the west of the United States, a merger has occurred such that the vowel a ah in cot and the vowel a ah in caught have merged into the single vowel a. Ah. And that phenomenon is called the cot caught merger. So you can hear that I don't have the merger. For me, these sound different. I grew up speaking a dialect where these are different. Many of you likely grew up speaking a dialect where these are the same. Merger is any situation where two previously distinct sounds are merged into one. So now that we've identified this particular variation in form, which we think maps to geographical regions, we can start drawing something that we call isoglosses. So each variant of this word, cot, whether it's cot or caught, is associated with some geographical region. An isogloss is a geographic line that you can draw on a map which demarcates where people have one variant as opposed to another. So for example, this is the isogloss map for the cot-caught merger as of 1996, and it's actually changed since then. And to the, the, it looks a little different in the year 2021, but this is what the isogloss was in 1996. So the idea here is we have these lines on the map. The areas where the red ticks are pointing inwards, those are the areas where people have the cot-caught merger, where people pronounce cot and cot the same. The areas outside the red regions are where people do not have the cot-caught merger, so they pronounce cot and caught as two different sounds. And you can see that essentially the merger is highly associated with the West and also certain areas of New England and certain areas around Ohio, interestingly. And if you look at this in even more detail, you'll see that the actual locations on this map, these correspond to locations where linguists went and did surveys and tested whether people pronounce these two words differently. You'll see that uh, the, the blue dots correspond to areas where cot and cot are different. The red ones correspond to areas where cot and cot are the same. You can see that the isogloss actually is still kind of an imperfect representation of the true geographical distribution of the merger. So there are some areas in California, like it looks like uh, north of the Bay Area there, where people do not have the merger. But in the vast majority of areas in the West, people do have the merger, and the isogloss line captures that. 
And as I said, if you look at a more updated map, the line will have moved. These lines move around as languages change, as varieties sort of transfer from one dialect into another. So here's another major phonetic variant in United States English, which will define another isogloss, which will enable us to define dialect regions. So here's a word, P-I-N, and you pronounce it pin. In just about every dialect of US English, you would pronounce this pin. Here's another word, P-E-N. How would you pronounce this? So if you grew up in the West, you would say pen, and these would be different. Pin and pen are different to you, likely, if you grew up in the West. If you grew up in other regions, though, in particular, if you grew up in the South of the United States, then you would pronounce the second word as pin. It would be exactly the same as the first. So in these dialects, if you want to refer to a pin, like the thing you would wear on your shirt, you would call it a stick pin. And if you wanted to refer to a pen, like the thing you write with, you would call that a writing pin. In both cases, the word would be pronounced pin. So this is another merger which affects certain dialect regions of the United States. This is called the pin-pen merger. I have the pin-pen merger. If you listen very carefully, you'll hear that I, I mix them up sometimes. This means that in terms of phonology, some US English speakers have a phonological rule which says that the phoneme e is expressed as the sound i when it appears before nasals. So this is a variation in the phonological rules which apply in the language, and they vary based on region. So here's the pin-pen isogloss. So the areas where the red ticks are pointing in, that's where people have the merger and they pronounce pin and pen the same way. So you can see that it's primarily associated with the south of the US. It's also associated with some areas of central California, interestingly. In many cases, these isogloss patterns reflect it, patterns of migration. So when people migrate, especially as a community, they often carry their dialect with them. So you can often read off migration patterns from these sorts of maps. But the main thing I want to point out here is just that the pin-pen merger is basically a southern US feature. Here is another way in which dialects vary, in this case, in terms of their lexical semantics. So what do you call this thing? What do you call this thing? So many of you are going to call it a bucket. But many of you might also call it a pail. And you've certainly heard the word pail. So where do people say bucket? Where do they say pail? It turns out you can draw an isogloss for this. And the isogloss is right here in the northeastern United States. It cuts through Pennsylvania. So the dotted line here is the pale bucket isogloss. North of the line, people say pale. South of the line, people say bucket. And this is actually a really, really interesting case because it shows us that isoglosses sort of pattern together in something called isogloss bundles. So there are other isoglosses which are shown here. For example, the dotted line indicates what you call, um, what I would call a dragonfly, the thing that flies around and it's got four wings and it's often colorful, maybe green. Um, south of the dotted line, you call it a dragonfly. North of the dotted line, you call it a darning needle. Another example would be this, this solid line, which indicates what you call a certain kind of tree. So to the north of the line, it's called a whiffle tree. To the south, it's called a swingle tree. I don't have any idea what this tree is but the dialectologists are experts in these sort of very specific words, these very specific items that have very specific words within dialects. They're often things like names of trees, names of plants, names of bugs. So we see that these three isoglosses for these three words are not exactly overlapping. They're actually sort of bundled together, but they're not exactly the same. So if you imagine driving north through Pennsylvania, What's going to happen here is that eventually people are going to start saying pail instead of bucket. And then they're going to start saying whiffle tree instead of swingle tree. And then they're going to start saying darning needle instead of dragonfly. As you go from town to town, the words are going to sort of change one by one. It's a dialect continuum. And you are going to smoothly but rapidly transition from a more sort of Midlands dialect to a more New England dialect where you have these particular lexical items. So essentially what we see is that
when you map out all of these isoglosses, let's say you collect a whole bunch of variants, you observe a whole bunch of mergers, a whole bunch of lexical changes, you map out the isoglosses, what you're going to see is that they pattern together in these sort of bundles called isogloss bundles. And that is how we define dialect boundaries. That's how we define the major dialects. The major dialects are separated from each other by these isogloss bundles. So isogloss bundle is when multiple isoglosses are bundled together, they're clustered together in space. And they, we use them to define dialect boundaries. All right, so now that we sort of know the procedure, we're going to look for variants, we're going to look for isoglosses, we can start to talk about what are the major variants that define the US American dialects. We're going to start by looking at the dialect which I would call, uh, you might call the North here. This is the dialect which is primarily associated with places like Chicago, Michigan, Minnesota, etc. The Northern dialect of the United States, English. So the Northern dialect is primarily signaled by something called the Northern Cities Shift. This is a sound change which occurred in the Northern dialect, which looks like this. So in the Northern dialect, the phoneme A ah is going to be expressed as the sound A. Ah. And the phoneme A ah is going to be expressed as the sound E. Eh. And the phoneme E eh is going to be expressed as the sound A. Uh. And the phoneme A uh is going to be expressed as the sound A. Ah. So we see that it's a shift in the sounds. The sounds are moving around. And if we look at some examples, I think they're going to make a lot of sense to you. So people who speak this dialect, when they say the word which in other dialects of US English would be pronounced bag, they're going to say big. They say big instead of bag. They're going to say lack instead of lock. They're going to say boss instead of bus. So if you think about someone from Chicago, if you know anyone from Chicago who grew up in Chicago, who grew up in a community of other people from Chicago, then the way they pronounce the name of the city is something like Chicago, right? Chicago, that is the northern city's vowel shift. And if we look at these changes in vowels in terms of the vowel space, it actually makes a lot of sense what's going on here. So basically, the vowel a ah shifts to the vowel a. Ah. So you can see that this sound, which in most US dialects is going to be a, ah, moves forward. And it ends up occupying the part of the vowel space which is normally occupied by the vowel a. Ah. And then, as if to compensate, the vowel a ah moves up to a. Eh, and then the vowel a eh moves back to a, uh, and the vowel a uh moves further back to a. Uh. So what we see is that um, the vowels are sort of circulating in the vowel space. It's like one vowel moved forward, moved forward in the vowel space, and the other vowels had to move out of the way, and you got this sort of circular pattern which is called a chain shift. A chain shift like this is a very, very common thing that happens in language change. So in this case, it's easy to think about why this happens. Remember that vowel systems have something called the principle of maximal distinctiveness. That means the vowels want to maintain phonetic distinctiveness from each other. So when one vowel moves and gets really close to another one, that other vowel has to get out of the way to maintain maximal distinctiveness. So this is called a chain shift. Chain shifts are very, very common in language change. In fact, the English language as a whole underwent a gigantic chain shift in the uh, 15th and 16th century, which is in large part responsible for our somewhat confusing spelling system. So chain shifts are quite common. What happened in the north of the United States is that this chain shift, um, which had already affected the entire English language, sort of continued. And in the rest of the dialects, it did not continue. So the northern dialect also has a syntactic form which is not present in other US dialects. Remember, dialects are not just accents. They also encompass variation in syntactic forms. So in the North, you can say things like, you can use this construction, which we call the needs verbed construction. You can say something like, the table needs cleaned. And that would be what you would express in other dialects as the table needs to be cleaned. So in most dialects of US English, if I gave you the sentence, the table needs cleaned, you would say it's ungrammatical. You might not even be sure what it means. 
but in the northern dialect of the United States, they have additional syntactic rules which make this grammatical. This is a perfectly normal thing to say in this dialect. No one would bat an eye, and it's used quite commonly. So that's the northern dialect. The next one I want to talk about is New England, New England dialect spoken in this region here. So the New England dialect is primarily characterized by being what's called non-rhotic. And so I'm going to explain what that means. A non-rhotic dialect is one where the phoneme R is expressed as the sound U uh before a consonant, or it's deleted, and it's expressed as the sound er when it appears before vowels. So this is the phenomenon which is colloquially called R dropping. That means this is a non-rhotic dialect. A rhotic dialect is one where you pronounce the R. A non-rhotic dialect is one where you do not pronounce the R in these scenarios. So basically, New England dialect has a phonological rule which looks like this. The phoneme R is expressed as the sound R when it appears before a vowel. And the phoneme R is deleted, it's expressed as nothing, otherwise. So in New England, in particular, the R is deleted. In other non-rhotic dialects, it's replaced with a vowel like schwa. So think about how you would pronounce a sentence like this in a non-rhotic dialect like is spoken in New England. Think about how you would pronounce this. So the phonetics would come out as pakya karan havadyat. I'm just reading off the phonetic symbols there. So remember, the sound R gets deleted, except when it appears before a vowel. You get pakyakar and havadyad. Now, it's important to note that it's not the case that the R is deleted everywhere. It's still pronounced in the word car here. You say pakyakar and havadyad. This is actually a common mistake that you hear people like movie actors make when they're trying to fake this dialect. They'll drop the R everywhere. But in the real New England dialect, you retain the R when it appears before a vowel. And that's typically the pattern in other non-rhotic dialects of English.